Hey, there, Paul. How you doing? Thank good. you. Good. How are Great you? To be here. How's your? Good. Uh, how's the? Um, it seems, I don't know, but it seems like this would be a stressful time because it's just before this all gets going. It is, it is very stressful. In fact, this is kind of peak stress. The whole year kind of builds up to essentially this moment. You're basically like Santa Claus. It's a little bit like Santa Claus, yeah. yeah you're, and, every, all the pressure's on one particular time of year. Yeah, uh, we do have year-round programming. I, I want to get that in. And, 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 and preparing for NaNoWriMo, it's such a huge kind of writing party. And it lasts, you know, obviously a whole month it takes the whole year to get ready for yeah, it. Like we, sure. we literally, it is like Santa Claus. I guess Santa Claus is making toys the whole year. And yeah, then yeah. Goes you guys, out for one you guys are working the whole time. It's just that this is when you get to show it off. I will think of myself as Santa Claus going forward. Okay. Um, <laughs> Got to grow my beard out more. You do. We both have, yeah. I have those same, I have the same white patches that you do. <laughs> Um, which is I'll uh, take questions about the white patch. Feel yeah, free. that's it. That's all we're going to talk about. <laughs> um, speaking of questions, I want to I want to kick you off with uh, three yeah. completely unrelated to writing. Good. Questions. Okay. Good. So uh, a little about where I am. I'm actually in Nashville, Tennessee, because I'm yeah. on the road right now. Uh, I've built a little podcast studio here, so I'm going to try to um, make these as Nashville related as possible. So all right. first question, they're all either ors. Yeah. First one is. Nashville or Asheville? Which do you prefer? Oh man, that is so tough because I love Asheville. Asheville's great. Yeah, Asheville's super good. I've I've been to each once. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a great day, and each for a very short time. I was mm -hmm. in Asheville once just for a day. They had the coolest bookstore. This was in 1987. Mm -hmm. um, I I think I'd have to go with Nashville though because I've been living in cities for the last uh, nearly 30 years, and, mm -hmm. and and Nashville is so cool. So much good music there. It really uh, is. I should just go. I got to go back to get outside and just get into the scene of Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Next question. Um, yes. Hot chicken or fried chicken? So in Nashville, there's a lot of talk of hot chicken, which is like this really spicy. Do you prefer your? Do you would you yeah. like just hot chicken or regular fried chicken? You know, there's just a fried chicken, definitely. You know, okay. like Good. you, you want to get the essence. You don't want like something covering up the, the hotness. You you, you don't yeah. want just to eat hotness. Yeah, you need the, the <laughs> you're, a, you're a purist is what you're, yeah, that's what I'm a purist. Yeah. I like, I like my scotch with nothing in it. it you, as you should, which relates to my third question. I was, I yeah. actually went up to um, the southern part of Kentucky from here is where Mammoth uh, Cave National Park is. Uh -huh. And I drove up today and met my brother. He and his wife were down from Wisconsin. And so I was in this cave looking at like the, the, where the water had come in, all that. And it, it, of course, filters through limestone. And that's what allows for bourbon and, and rye and all of these things to be distilled in Kentucky is all these limestone formations that kind of filter the water. Uh -huh. They have such great water that they're able to make great bourbon and rye. And so my, my last of these questions is, are you a bourbon guy or a rye guy? Wow, that is so tough. And um, since we've both spent time in Iowa, um, mm -hmm. one of my one of my pleasures in Iowa is walking walking off the plane and seeing this big ad for Templeton Rye. That's which right. Is made in, made in Iowa. Uh, and as much, you know, I like Templeton Rye, but I think I think bourbon bourbon. Uh, Do you general. know? So so as as Grant mentioned, we're we're both connected to Iowa. You're from Iowa. I went to college in Iowa. There yeah. was a legend about Templeton rye that in the old days when they first started making it, farmers would like put a $20 bill on the fence post or something. And then Templeton would come by and like leave a bottle of rye on each <laughs> fence post where they had it, like prohibition era or something. Is yeah. that, do you know if that's, there's, I have no idea, but it sounds like a really good story and a really good way to mark your Templeton, right? Mark it yeah. your Templeton, yeah, right? Exactly. Just I like mean, that limestone story you told. Right. I'm like, I'm like, is that true? Or is that just like this well, mystique that they've created you, around the, you know, we were talking in Asheville when I was in Asheville three or four years ago. Um, I was, there was, there's so many breweries in Asheville and I was talking about this with some bartender and yeah. he said, yeah, we're actually now per capita, most breweries in the country. We've taken over Portland's old position. Wow. That's and tough. I said, Portland's I said got well, a lot. what's the deal with the breweries? Right. And he's like, well, it's the water. The water is so good here that it, like hmm. basically anybody can make great beer. And it's the same thing. It hmm. all comes back to this like limestone filtering, which makes for great. Wow. Water. Okay going to buy property and on in, on water reserves in Asheville uh -huh. fortune uh-huh <laughs> or at least uh, have a drunken retirement 
Yeah. All right. Let's get to uh, let's get to business of writing and you yes. and NaNoWriMo. Um, I I will one little mea culpa. When we were promoting this, I know that you are the executive director of NaNoWriMo and you founded yeah. um, the is it is it one hundred story? How do one hundred word story? All the stories have to be exactly one hundred words. Right. So and that's sort the of, shorter side of my life. I sort of conflated those, and I said you were the founder of NaNoWriMo, which. I don't want to take away from all of the great things you've done, but it is true that you didn't actually found it. And I want to make sure people are aware of that because I screwed yes. up. Yes. Um, Thank you for doing that because that mistake has been made innumerable times. And I feel so bad because Chris Beatty founded it and he's this wonderful guy. I'm just going to promote his book here. Oh, no cool. Plot, No Problem by Chris Beatty. And we, we wouldn't be here today without him. So yeah, thank you so, for correcting that. So how did you come on? What was the process that brought you to National Novel Writing Month? Yeah, a couple of different things. On the level of writing, uh, I just wanted to shake up my, my writing experience. I, I, I asked myself, this was in 2009, <coughs> excuse me, um, and I asked myself, did I find my creative process, did I determine it, or did it kind of just choose me? And so I wanted to be more deliberate about it, and so I decided to experiment with it. And I was a very ponderous, precious, slow writer, so I would just revise the first chapter of a novel over and over again until I got it perfect and then I could move on to chapter two. And so what I learned from this though is that once I completed a novel and went back to revise, I would inevitably cut chapter one or dramatically rewrite it. And so the, all those hours of perf you know perfecting it or days perfecting it were just kind of for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to use this Joyce Carol Oates quote. Um, she says, you don't know the first sentence of your novel until you've written the last sentence. And so that puts it on a great framework for me because it, your, your first draft is really exploring the story and getting the story out. And it doesn't matter how messy it is. You don't need to perfect the first chapter. And then once you know the whole, you know, or know somewhat of the whole story, you can go back and revise and shape it and make it better. So that's how I creatively ended up in NaNoWriMo. And that was 2009. At that time, I was working for this nonprofit, the National Writing Project here in Berkeley. And I was very committed to working for nonprofits and especially writing or arts related nonprofits. And Chris Beatty was an acquaintance of mine. And I reached out to him just for some guidance and asked him if he knew of any, you know, nonprofits in the East Bay that um, needed board members. And he said, hey, why don't we have lunch and talk about it? And um, then he invited me on his board, uh, which was a surprise. And then when I uh, joined the board, uh, he mentioned that he was stepping down mm. and he said, you should apply for the job. And so he kind of twisted my arm. I mean, he didn't need to twist it per se, but I hadn't planned my life to be an executive director. So he kind of convinced mm -hmm. me to do it. So yeah, and here I am. How, like, I would imagine running my own kind of writing organization slash business that it has certainly caused me to want to practice what I preach, right? So like, I feel like I can't yeah. talk about it unless I'm doing the thing. Exactly. How, how has this affected your own writing practice? You know, I, on numerous levels, it's really great for me. I mean, I was, before NaNoWriMo, I was a very solitary writer. I didn't, strangely enough, I didn't really take part in a larger community that much. And I'd gone and got my MFA and I'd been a writer for years. And I had some writer friends, but I wasn't actively really part of a community, I wouldn't say. And so NaNoWriMo is so much about community and so I'm talking to writers so often, and I, I just believe that every writer should participate, join, nurture a community. You know, it's just such a powerful thing on many levels. And the reasons I didn't participate in the community, I think, were, were character flaws and weaknesses, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I think NaNoWriMo has really opened me up to the wonders and magic of being part of a community, for one. But then also, like, NaNoWriMo has, it's, it's like so much of writing you learn about the anguishing parts of writing, you know? Mm -hmm. And NaNoWriMo is so much about making writing fun and whimsical. And I think like we, we oftentimes as, as writers forget that playful aspect of writing and creativity and how that can help us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think that emphasis on playfulness that NaNoWriMo has is really important. And it's emphasis on creative experimentation. You mentioned that in your own history, you, you had these quote character flaws that prevented you from seeing writing as a, a communal activity what do you think you would tell that version of yourself directly about, you know, what you've learned about community and working with other people? Yeah, I think uh, we can, 
what I've noticed with a lot of people is they are, they, they're really good at talking themselves out of things. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to get better at talking ourselves into things. So when like community things would happen to me, like I, I remember getting invited to do readings and I declined or I found a way out of, you know, doing the readings. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of self-sabotaging in a way. And I think um, that was really because of a shyness and an insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I think we sometimes, it's like a performance anxiety thing. I think we project some of our worst fears on the world instead of realizing that every single writer in, in the room is uh, feeling insecure to some mm -hmm. degree and shy. And most, and everybody's rooting for you in the end, uh, especially when you go to readings. Mm -hmm. And um, and also, yeah, just getting over that. I think, I think sometimes in, in writing communities, um, they can be intimidating because sometimes there's a hierarchy in place, you know, like who's been published and who hasn't been published and who gets to speak at some conference and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that hierarchy is, yeah, it was really intimidating to me. And I wish I would have just not thought about it because um, the thing, one of the things, I mean, other than there's a lot of creatively wonderful, nourishing things about communities, but they're also great in terms of networking and opening doors for you. And so, you know, I, my, I, I can't even, I should write a list of all the things that have happened to me, like on a professional level, just because of the people I knew, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. And I do the same. I, I, I look out for my friends or I look out for people I know. I want to open doors for people. It feels mm -hmm. good. Yeah, and I, I think sometimes, I, I've gone through this too, where there is a temptation to want to be recognized or to succeed based on your own merits or what we perceived to be our own merits not realizing that it always takes help it all it, mm -hmm. inevitably it takes um teachers coaches trainers whomever um that can push you or or put you into a position where you're connected to the right people and i and i do think that some of that is our own ego right like especially yeah. when we're younger we, we, we want to believe like well no i'm gonna do this because i'm good at it right exactly yeah, I think there's a lot of that. And I think especially with writing, because it's such a generally solitary act, you know, that we think we can do it all ourselves. Mm. And I, every writer, I mean, I, I oftentimes think that writers totally don't, um, they don't value um, the, the, I would say it takes a village to write a novel, definitely takes a village to publish a novel. Mm. And sometimes I think writers forget that there are a lot of people there kind of lifting them up and getting them there. Yeah, totally. What, um, I, I, in in building a business and and also like building a writing career and also building a basketball career, I'm always really interested in inflection points. Like when you notice, oh, that wasn't working, or that that thing is working, we should do more of that. Um, have there? I'm sure there have been a lot of those. But do you remember any <laughs> that really like affected you? I I remember at Writers Block, we used to um, in the physical space, we would give people name tags like, "Hi, my name is Grant." Right. And when we switched to having permanent lanyards that we then stamped each time people came, it was like this, this, it seems subtle, but like just that made it seem much more serious because now we were giving people tote bags when they came 10 times and, and t-shirts yeah. 20 times. And it was weird how like just that small thing, even though that wasn't, you know, the thing that like made us different or anything, um, it definitely, sh it made kind of a switch in us did you have you i'm sure you've seen some of those are there examples that you can think of yeah there, there are probably a lot of them and exactly i think the, the, the ones that are seemingly small like that from name tag to lanyard is fascinating because that's a whole different model like you're doing the whole kind of a reward system that's quite different and we right. have reward systems like that at NaNoWriMo and i think uh i think one is just um switching from or, or accommodating like we started out, I mean, we're, we're, we're known for National Novel Writing Month, of course. That's our big event. It's like mm -hmm. our Oscars, our Super Bowl, whatever. Um, but we're not just that. We've grown beyond that. When I mentioned earlier that we're a year-round organ, uh, writing organization. So we host other events, either month-long events or what we're now calling mini events. And that's what we're really experimenting with now. And we built a whole new website to support this. So it's, it's essentially like Fitbit for novelists. You can enter... Uh, any any type of writing project and goal that you want to on our site and then you know track your progress and you know build in accountability mm -hmm. I, I always say we exist before Fitbit does so they're NaNoWriMo for walkers mm -hmm. um, but yeah so I think this was an interesting inflection point this idea that you could you could we could we could 
um, support this big event and then also keep people in the community, support them with their writing goals throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're really seeing that begin to take off and, and especially as we build the, the website out. And it's like a re-education of people. When I first came here in 2012, I would see comments in our forums where people would be like, uh, I had this wonderful experience during November. This would be like early December. They'd be like, is, is, are things still happening here? Are the lights still on? Mm -hmm. And I hated reading that because the lights were still on mm -hmm. and we just need to make it more apparent to people that we support year round writing. Yeah, how, how do you, how do you communicate that to people? The, the idea that like this isn't, it's not just enough to do this one month a year because I've seen that happen at, at Writer's Block. People get excited about NaNoWriMo come in right because uh, like you know the goal for those who are not familiar and you can correct me grant if i'm wrong i think the goal is usually to write a fifty thousand word first draft in yeah. a month right? right um and and i've seen people love that but then like you're saying then it just like kind of falls away for them what advice do you give people for continuing that yeah, it's interesting. Some people just like doing it for the one month, you know, they want to show up once a year. It's kind of like, like Christmas, as you said, mm -hmm. and they write with their friends and have a great time. And that's great because we want to support creativity for creativity's sake. That's part of the magic of NaNoWriMo. Mm -hmm. And then there are other people who have aspirations to publish, you know, and um, I think one of the, the beauties of NaNoWriMo is that we are this writing boot camp. You know, mm -hmm. we, we help teach the discipline of showing up every day. We help teach people that inspiration doesn't just happen to you. You have to create it on the page and your words create it for you. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, there are a lot of lessons there. And, and, and that, you know, becoming a master in anything. I love that 10,000 uh, hour rule. You know, it might not be technically correct, but I do think you've got to put in your time. Mm -hmm. And that you can gain mastery. You know, you're not born with writing talent. Um, so yeah, what we tell people, I think, I think we just... Um, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, the, the number of people who join a gym in January, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think something like 80% of the people who make a resolution to, to work out more in January and join a gym, like 80% of them have quit by early February. Right, you know? right, yeah. And so, and so this is like a human behavior pattern that mm -hmm. one has to come over. And I think it applies to writing too. So I think that's where we come in with like, we can host events and we can provide these like short bursts, these kind of training camps of writing, but mm -hmm. we also allow people to set their own goals. And we also have a, ver a variety of different ways to participate in the community and the community provides its own sort of galvanizing momentum. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think we, I, I, it's just a constantly trying to reach people where they are and invite mm -hmm. them either back in or kind of help them create that momentum that keeps them going. Do you, do you, um, do you notice like certain, times during the month when people are most likely to fall off even during november even during november uh so there are times like that we a lot of people actually fall off after like five days oh yeah um and this is this is like a cha a really big challenge for us actually because i think what happens is, is that um like if you write say three of those five days and you, you skip two days mm -hmm. you're already like 3500 words behind Right. And, and so I think like that can be such a, a daunting thing. And, and a lot of people say, well, I'm never going to catch up. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to talk to them either to recalibrate their goal, reset their goal. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we've seen so many people like get this renewed enthusiasm for their novels if they keep writing. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll have these big power gusts of writing and catch up or, even, you know, we, we've had people write 40,000 words in the last week, you know? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Big comeback stories like that. So, and, mm -hmm. and the main thing really, you know, if you're 3,500 words behind on day five, it's, it's, that's not the most important thing about NaNoWriMo. The most important thing is to show up and keep going and try to reach your goal. You right. Know? So I, right. I always tell people just write the other 25 days, just see where it goes. If you mm -hmm. write 20,000 words in those 25 days, that's tremendous, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of words in a month. Do you know, and I, again, I just don't know this, this answer, I mean, that's why I'm asking <laughs> the question, which is fundamentally why you ask questions, Paul. Um, <laughs> do, obviously the focus is, is novel writing, but what percentage of people are working on, you know, memoir or nonfiction? There must be some people doing that, right? Yeah, definitely, but I think it's, it's, it's really high. It's like 98, 99% novels. Oh, really? Um, wow. Um, yeah, although I, 
I, we totally welcome people to, to work on memoirs. I don't want to ever discourage anyone. Yeah, what if you're like, you can't, I'm sorry, this is, that's unacceptable. We're going to yeah. put cameras in your house and we exactly. saw that you were writing nonfiction and that we can't handle that. <laughs> exactly. I was on a call earlier today and people were asking me the rules. And I was like, we will not call the police. <laughs> you know, there, there are no laws against writing memoir during National Novel Writing Month. Right, yeah. right. We are, like, we are supportive of all sorts of writing. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, cool. So I now am, I'm just like really ginning to try to, to try this out. We're going to promote a couple of people to, uh, right. to ask us some questions. Um, so Scott has been DMing with some folks to, mm. um, to, to select them. Uh, I'm yeah. going to now, what I'm going to do guys, if, uh, if Scott's been DMing you is that I'll promote you to panelists, please have a shirt on. Um, and, uh, and then we <laughs> will, uh, we will hear from you. And we want to just have a chance to bounce this around between Grant and me um, about ways that we can uh, help you have a great November in writing. So first up, yeah. um, Arlo Kildrake, you are, uh, you are coming down. You're coming up. You're about to become a panelist here in a second. Um, and uh, we're going to see your shining face on here in a second. Um, great name, Arlo. A lot of great... Arlo is just a fantastic, fantastic name. Arlo Guthrie, but Arlo Quotlerick's a better name. Arlo, what's happening, man? Hello, hello. Uh, Thanks for, uh, take, first of all, let me ask you this. Where are you, uh, where are you ringing in from? Uh, from a little town called Lake City in, uh, in the middle of nowhere in the deep south Arkansas. <laughs> Great, right. we're close. I'm in Nashville right now. You come on over and we'll uh, hang out. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get together, watch a game or something. It'll right, be great. Right. All right, cool. So what's, uh, what question do you have for Grant or for both of us? What's, what's on your mind? Uh, so the question I had, uh, I'm trying to read it off because I typed it in, but I don't actually see it anymore, so I'll have to do it from memory. Uh, my question was for both of you, actually. Uh, I'm sorry. I was asked, uh -huh. I was told once by a friend of mine that uh, a lot of people seem to think that uh, – Pantsers or, or discovery writers, as he calls them, are they have more real, more vivid characters because that that interaction between the author and the page is happening immediately, and, and it's coming straight from the author's heart, and that uh, planners can't really get that kind of character development or that character realism immediately. And I'm wondering, do do either of you agree with that, or do you think that there's a way that planners could have these very real, very vivid characters? So Grant, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass this to you after I yeah. do a little bit of clarifying. So Arlo, okay. as Grant said, great name, and I'm excited about <laughs> that. And I like this question. It's something that that comes up at Writer's Block a lot. What uh, Arlo is talking about is that there's a, a a term in novel writing of like if you're a pantser, I I e you will fly by the seat of your pants. You don't have an outline necessarily. You're just sort of like discovering it, as Arlo also said, as you go versus being a planner, which is to then create more of a detailed outline and try to kind of fill in the experiences as you go. Grant, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. I do. I'm going to throw a third term in there that we talk about this all the time in, in, in NaNoWriMo and especially in October as we get ready to write novels, like what's the best creative process to use for your novel. And so the other term is planter which is between a planner and a pantser. You take, you take the best of the planning side and the best of the pantsing side. Everybody does this in a different way. I consider myself a planter. We recently did a survey of NaNoWriMo writers and I thought planners or pantsers would win, but planters overwhelmingly won. Mm. So I think, I think um, yeah, and you can define that in a lot of different ways. But I think the, the heart of your question, Arlo, is really, really important. And I think sometimes um, people who research a lot or do a lot of planning. I think what your friend is saying is that they are, they're sort of like logically determining their novel perhaps and not writing as much from the heart. And it's, and, and, and whereas like a pantser, you're just probably closer to your heart because you're just making up things as you go along, especially if you have to write fast, like in NaNoWriMo. So I don't, I'm not gonna take a side here because I think you can write just as vivid characters as a planner as you can a pantser. Uh, because ideally as a writer, and this goes for everybody, I think you're writing, it, especially in this discovery draft, as you said, you're writing for a sense of discovery, you should be writing for a sense of mystery, you should be writing to answer questions. Um, 
And so that's what, no matter who you are, I think even if you've meticulously outlined your novel like a planner, and some of those planners have like 20 page outlines, um, I think they still have to allow themselves to write for a sense of mystery. And the planners I've talked to, the best type of planners, um, they allow themselves to, to break the plan, you know, like in their first draft, as they should. You know, the first draft is partly a planning draft. It's a discovery draft. And so I call it a zero draft because I think if you call it a first draft, you're too far along. The zero draft allows you to, be, to jump in with pure discovery. Then you can outline it afterwards, actually, and write the first draft. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my take. Arlo, are you, are you planning to, uh, to write in November? Uh, I am. This is actually going to be my first uh, NaNoWriMo, and I am very excited mm -hmm. about it. I bought nice. it with us. I, I've been listening to the Right Minded podcast for like two years now, which is the podcast that uh, oh, cool. I'm the host on. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, my lovely fiance is very supportive. She's actually uh, probably eavesdropping outside the door now, trying not to interrupt. Nice. So. <laughs> That's great, man. Um, what, uh, w one thing that I've written now, um, two novels that I put in the trash and then one novel that's going to come out actually in February. And one thing that I've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about is um, before I even get, get going to spend so much time writing about who the characters are and, and how they're related, not in a familial way, but like how they're going to interact, creating almost like little trees of like this person interacts with this person because they're, he's the principal and she's a teacher or whatever the thing might be. Um, and what I've really gotten excited about is that, like Grant's kind of talking about, it becomes a little bit of planting in that I know the characters so well that they almost start behaving according to how they would behave without me controlling them. It's kind of, mm -hmm. it's trippy. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about writing fiction in a really, really rapid way is that you kind of get out of your own head and suddenly these characters yeah. are just doing stuff that you never would have imagined. So, you know, I, I, Think it might be valuable even this weekend for you to really sit down and think about who are these characters and then i bet you'll be surprised with what they pull off so arlo are you are you gonna plan are you planning are you pantsing are you planting uh, what's your approach here so i've actually been writing for several years online and for my friends and i've always been a pantser always just immediately jumped right into it and, and yeah. had, just had fun with it uh but Good. for this nanorama i want to do something special and i've actually been planning uh the vast majority of everything i'm going to write this november okay okay cool well Where i you always at? say do something different uh during nanorama and you're doing that like creatively experiment you'll find out something new about yourself where are you going to do the the actual the actual writing is it at your house do you have a coffee shop you're planning to go to any of those things yeah, so this is actually uh, the room I'm in now is my study. Uh, this is where I come to do all of my writing. This is where I come to just be quiet and listen for inspiration sometimes. And this this spot right here is actually where I'm probably going to do the majority of it. Okay, cool. I would uh, just recommend figuring out a way when you're done with a session to make sure that you reward yourself in some way so that if that the next day you remember like, Oh, when I go to that sacred space, something great happens. And you know, the writing is of course we hope will be fun, but it'll also be onerous at times. So come up with some little thing that just is, that feels kind of like a treat that allows you to feel like, Oh, this is, this is my happy place. Can I add to that? Um, they've done psychological studies on this and, and, and per the reward system, you know, a lot of people will say, I'll, I'll buy a special bottle of wine, or if I write 50,000 words, I'll treat myself to a spa weekend or something like that. The rewards that matter the most are the implicit rewards. And so they've actually done studies that you'll, your brain will fire more of whatever chemical it's supposed to fire, just looking at your bar chart on the NaNoWriMo website going up with your word count. Like mm -hmm. that is a reward that will give, that you'll work harder for than you will that spa weekend, or that's what the research shows. Arlo, thanks for uh, for hanging out with us, um, and uh, we are going to be sending you the best of thoughts. Yeah, for getting this thing uh, pushed along the way. Um, I hope. Will you? Here's what I would ask: Can you just pledge to me? You don't have to do it to Grant. I know that you're you've listened to his podcast for a long time, so you may be intimidated by him. Um, <laughs> so there's going to be a day, like I don't know what day, four, seven, whatever. When you hit that day, will you pledge now that you'll just keep going? 100%. I will. All right. I will. Just because of this conversation, I've enjoyed so much. I, I, right. prom I promise you that I will. All right. Great. We, Report uh, back to we, us, Arlo. I want to hear how you did. I definitely will. Thank All you. Right. Thank
so much. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, now we have to figure out how to make uh, this. Is guys, sorry, I'm gonna. I think Arlo should stay the whole show. Yeah, we're Arlo's <laughs> now uh, our. Um, let's see if you're. Are you who's David Letterman and who? I don't know. I don't know what's happening here. All right, we've uh, we have another question from um, from Sebastian. Let me find Sebastian real quick. Everybody's got great names. I know these are. I want a new there. name. Grant is a pretty good name. That's a strong name, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, but this, I think it was, yeah, Sebastian Moses. That's great. Grant Faulkner, you even have a writer's last name. Oh. Well, a lot to live up to there. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot to handle. Um, I also just wanted to mention that uh, we appreciate these questions. All right, Sebastian, yeah. you're on. Hello, yeah. can you hear me all right? Yes, could you tell us a yeah. little bit about where you are in the world? I am currently living in Baltimore, Maryland. All right. All right. This feels this feels very national to me and that yeah. is exciting <laughs> and fitting with it being national novel writing. Yeah. Um what's uh what's on your mind? So, my question was, how do you keep yourself from falling out of love with your novel when you're powering through that first draft? Mm, that is a fine question. So uh, let me get, I'm going to again pass this over to Grant to start, but I want to okay. get a little more background from you, Sebastian. Um, where in the writing process are you? Have you, will this be like Arlo, a, a first NaNoWriMo? Are you, have you done these before? Are you writing all the time? What is your usual procedure or process? Um, so I've been doing NaNoWriMo for about nine years uh i started when i was oh, okay. like 12 or 13. um oh, i've only won twice and both of them were when i was uh like middle school a teenager mm -hmm. so it's <laughs> it's been rough and i've ra rarely met the fifty thousand word goal because i often find motivation or inspiration waning so it's something that's on my mind a lot okay um, and so so Back to the question at hand. I'm going to pass that back over to, to Grant. Um, okay. Sebastian, could you mute yourself just because we're getting a little feedback, I think. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. so Grant, how does one stay in love with their... That is, that is a big question. It is, right? That should, that should be the title of it. That's why I made book. you start answering. Yeah. Uh, I love the question because um, it's amazing. Like when you were asking that, I just thought that, that every novel is fraught with so many moments. They can be moments, they can be weeks, they can be months when you fall out of love with your novel mm -hmm. uh, in, in some way. And um, it is really the ultimate question. How do you rekindle that love? How do you fall back in love with it? How do you keep it going? Because some novels might take years to finish, you know? Um, so I think, and, 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 and inevitably, during, even during NaNoWriMo, you will fall out of love with your novel. You will hit a wall and you'll start hating it. And usually that happens in the middle of the month, what I call the muddy middle. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know why enthusiasm for a, for a creative project lasts about two weeks at the most. Mm -hmm. um, but that's when you start like really being challenged by it. And so it's just, it's just not playing in the same way that it did at the start. And I think sometimes we feel like it's getting messy and we feel like the words aren't, you know, th there's this whole, you know, the whole premise of NaNoWriMo is that challenge of having this wonderful image of a novel and a story in your mind and then how do you represent it on the page with words it's just so tough that chasm between the two and then you compare it to you know other people's writing your favorite authors and you it's easy to create a lot of doubt and a lot of disbelief in your story mm -hmm. and so i think i think like um one is just going back to that original moment when you fell in love with it, when you came up with the idea. What was it that really sparked your imagination that made you want to want, want to spend time with this idea? And then two, you know, maybe read some of your favorite scenes or some of your favorite passages. Um, I think a lot of times people hit the wall and like um, they think that they have to write the novel chronologically but you can jump ahead to scenes. So if you've planned out your novel, or if you have scenes in mind that you haven't written, go and write those and have fun with those and then come back, you know, and then you'll, you might be re-energized to those parts that you might not like so much. 
And then another great thing is like the, the community of NaNoWriMo, you know, participating with people, even just saying that, like I'm not in love with my novel or asking that question to others, how do you fall back in love with your novel? You'll get so many great responses. I feel like the NaNoWriMo community is this holder of writing wisdom and you just have to ask them and they will, you know, like a God sort of provide different types of answers. Um, but, you know, and the other part of the community is we have a thousand volunteers called municipal liaisons around the world and in an ordinary year they would be uh, organizing live in-person writing gatherings and and part of the part of their job is to make writing fun and so they'll do things like word sprints where they'll give you a prompt and tell you to write as fast as you can for five or ten minutes and so they turn it more into a game and and i think that that's a good way to get over those feelings of, of disbelief or those obstacles so I think there are a lot of different ways to, to, to fall back in love with your novel. And sometimes you just got to walk away from it and go do something pleasurable, take a little break and then come back to it. Um, but, but, you know, like when I was saying earlier that a lot of people quit on day five, don't be one of those people, you know, spend some time with it. <laughs> mm. I think people ditch it, ditch it too, too soon sometimes. Like, like the, the deepest love happens when you spend, when you deepen your commitment, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that too, to kind of piggyback on what you're saying, there's some value in speeding yourself up to kind of fall back in love. And, and that, that fits, I think, with a lot of the NaNoWriMo philosophy. I think sometimes what I see from writers is that they start to slow down and that's when you start to self-analyze and, and you're like, oh, that, that didn't work and I'm not very good at this. But if you tell yourself like, there's no looking back. I, I'm not going to be judgmental. I'm going to take a much more Buddhist kind of attitude of like non-judgment. Um, and in some ways thinking like, how could I write this in the worst way? What's the dumbest way I could do this? Knowing that you're going to get plenty of chances to edit it. Um, I was actually just uh, kind of writing about this. There's this idea in, that, that of course writing is editing and that one of the ways to phrase that is there's a Michelangelo quote about like there's a statue inside of every block of marble I just have, my job is to find the statue right mm -hmm. and, and so the that usually is referred to in terms of that you need to edit the block of marble down to the statue I think the thing you have to remember about writing a rough draft is that's you going out to the quarry to get the block of marble that's all you have to do you don't have to make it pretty you don't you, you just got to get it to your workshop um, and and like Grant was saying about thinking of it as draft zero, like it's, this is no one, I think no one should see your first draft, just you after you get away from mm -hmm. it for a few months. Um, and I think sometimes that can be really freeing because you're like, I'm just writing this for me and I'm, I'm aware that I'm not, this isn't going to be perfect. Uh, and then later I can make it into something that is readable. Paul, I like what you said about, well, I liked everything you said, but what you brought out about like kind of reading the dumbest sentence or, mm -hmm. or like identifying that. I think that that can ironically be good for you. And, and, and at the NaNoWriMo write-ins, after, after people do word sprints, there's often, they're asked to, to share their, their worst sentence. Mm -hmm. And so they get, to, they get to laugh at themselves, I think, which can yeah, lessen the pressure and help you fall back in love with your novel. Mm -hmm. And I wanna mention that there's a Twitter account, since so much is online this year, but we do this every year, it's called Nano Word Sprints. And around the clock during the month of November, um, people are holding, hosting word sprints on that account. And it's, it's super fun because they do things like that. They have people like, you know, tweet their, their either their favorite line or their worst line, something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, I think it's, it's so valuable too, to almost even give yourself that jump start of like, I'm a bad writer and I don't know how to write and I don't know how to express this character's words, but maybe what they would say is this, and like just write that out, you know, and then somehow magically, the something will come of it you know uh, i think yeah. it's there's a there's a we had this woman who's a uh, psychologist uh who talks a lot about the the behavior science behind like productivity and that sort of thing and she says there's a lot of value in cursing at yourself like there's actual evidence that like if you say a curse word to yourself to kind of get yourself going so anyway, mm. I, I don't, I'm not Sebastian telling you that you need to cuss yourself out, but um, <laughs> don't be afraid to just be as silly as possible. Um, Sebastian, I'm going to ask you kind of the same question. Oh, Grant, you had something there? No, I'll go for it. I was just going to say wearing a hat always helps, I think, in, yeah. in, all, in, in all conditions. In so, all yeah. conditions. Um, <laughs> Sebastian, uh, could you tell us a little bit about 
your setup for NaNoWriMo? What, where are you going to work? Um, are you going to give yourself some little rewards along the way? Do you have a, a system that you're thinking about putting in place? You're muted, by the way. No. Uh, yeah, um, I think the uh, biggest advantage that I have going into NaNo this year is community. Hmm. Um, I live with several members of my family and I actually got a lot of them to participate in NaNoWriMo with me as well as family members and friends who are across the country. So not only having that communal support online, but also in person, like someone who can hold you accountable, who lives with you, is really going to help. In terms of where I'm going to write, um, that's a trickier question. I think all I can say is an abandoned house without <laughs> giving, up, giving away too much about my personal situation. All right. That well, is a, sounds like we're going to write something haunt about a haunted house. That's just the, what comes to my mind. I want to, I want to, um, I think, uh, Sebastian, you're going to, you're going to win this year because you're wearing great writer gloves. Mm. You've got the perfect kind of fingerless <laughs> That's a key. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> your month there, Sebastian. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to make the same pledge that Arlo made to us. Okay. So when you hit the the tough spot on day four or five or fourteen, will you keep going? I will keep writing, not only for All the right. sake of myself, but for the sake of my story and for the sake of proving to my family members that they can do it too. Good. And we'll, and we'll we'll also need you to, to 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 take a blood oath and send it to us in the mail right, as well. Right. That's, that's, that's ex, extra bit of commitment there. Part of this deal. Uh, <laughs> I'll Sebastian, get on with that. Sebastian, thanks so much for the question. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Thank you for you're, answering. You're, you're gonna win, especially um, if you're writing in an abandoned house. So you know. Grant, you mentioned the idea of like a hat and we, and we talked about the gloves even. Um, I do think it, it is interesting how if you can change your physical circumstances, it can be so valuable to thinking like, well, now I'm in writer mode, right? Um, yeah. And I, I, I think it seems kind of silly, but that might be something as a takeaway for folks to just think about like, what is the thing like where you're like, every time I'm going to write, I put on a hat or I use special gloves or whatever it might be. Um, you have a, fa you have a kind of famous picture of you with a Viking hat on. Yeah. Does that, is that writing related? It kind of is the, the founder, Chris Beatty, this is just a plastic one. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he, he uh, used to have, I think, I think a real, not, well, not the real one, but something that looked kind of real. Mm -hmm. And he said he would, um, in moments of intense writer's block, he would grab the Viking helmet and put mm -hmm. it on. And so I think there is something about that kind of switching personas or, or changing yourself. And the, um, the writer Nicholson Baker, I remember he, he said that he would, he would do something different for each novel. So sometimes it could be just a matter of like writing in flip flops. Mm -hmm. um, but he would just do something different. So I think it's exactly what you're saying. It's like some sort of cue that puts you in writing mode. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think there's uh, like, I, I'm such a fan of putting myself in new physical surroundings as well as, as kind of a reward and also a little bit of like using my own bad habits against myself. So I have a little bit of a people pleaser tendency. And I mm -hmm. think if I can put myself in public, then I feel like, well, by staying focused on writing, I'm a little bit showing off that like I can do this, you know, that I'm, that I'm a serious writer. Um, mm -hmm. And again, that's, that's probably, that's definitely a, a bit of a personality flaw, um, but use those personality flaws, I think, or, or idiosyncrasies to, in order to set up a system for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I used to buy a new hat for every novel. I, I wish I still yeah. did. Um, I always like that to buy a hat that somehow kind of captured the spirit of the novel. Right. Are we talking like like fedoras and that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. It got oh, to be yeah. expensive. It got to be expensive. <laughs> actually, <laughs> there's a great hat store uh, nearby my house, and and they actually give a punch card for ten hats, which would cost well over a thousand dollars. So wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Grant, thanks so much for doing this, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed getting to field some questions. So yeah. thanks for uh, being willing to experiment. Um, could you quickly, and, and Scott can uh, post this, but what is the, the true, like, how does someone get going for NaNoWriMo? Where do they go online? 
Where do they go online? Uh, Na By the way, NaNoWriMo is a nonprofit. So everything is free. We believe that everyone has a story to tell and everyone's story matters. So we want everything to be free, to be fully inclusive and give people access. So you can go to nanorimo.org and sign up there. And then once you sign up, you, it'll walk you through the different steps uh, to set up your novel and join the community in different ways. Um, did you ask something else beyond that? No, that's I just, I, that's the, I think that's the main thing is like, what is the, Scott has just posted that in the, uh, in the there chat. we go. Um, so everybody click on that and head on over and, uh, and what you're going to find is you'll meet people like Arlo and Sebastian, who I, I think yeah. we all can take a little lesson from their enthusiasm for getting started. I know that, uh, it's easy, especially when you're in the midst of writing so much to feel just beaten down and like, well, what does it matter if another book exists? Um, and, and I think we could see that enthusiasm and feel it in their voices. And, and it got me going. I'm excited about it. Good, good. I just saw one of the, one of the chats, somebody said, go join your home re region. So yeah, once you sign up, go to the community tab and there's like, find your region. And then you could, you could sign up in Asheville, Nashville. Since you're deciding between living in Nashville and Denver, you could sign up for both regions and pick the one that's best as a way mm -hmm. to, to, to decide where to move to. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. All right, Grant, thanks, thanks for doing this. Oh, one last thing. Um, what if people want to stay in touch with you? I know you're on Twitter, but off the top of my head, I don't know your handle. That's simple. It's all Grant Faulkner, at Grant Faulkner on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I love to keep in contact with people. So yeah, so, yeah. so, so follow, give them a follow and, uh, and send them a message here at uh, Christmas time. All right. Thank you. This bye, is Grant. fun, Paul. Good Thank luck. You. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye.